The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went. You may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up an old flight of stairs or through a bad young act of parliament, but I mean to say you could have got a hearse up that staircase and taken it broadwise with the splinter bar towards the wall and the door towards the balustrade and done it easy. There was plenty of width for that and room to spare which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotion motive hearse going before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out in the street wouldn't have lighted the entry too well, so you may suppose that it was pretty dark with Scrooge's dip. Up Scrooge went, not carrying a button for that. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through all his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and a little saucepan of gruel. Scrooge had a cold in his head. Upon the hob, nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in the dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room, as usual. Old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers, and his nightcap, and sat before the fire to take its gruel. It was a very low fire, indeed. Nothing on such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel. The fireplace was an old one, built by some Dutch merchant long ago, and paved all around with quaint Dutch tiles designed to illustrate the scriptures. There were Cain's and Abel's, Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, angelic messengers descending through the air on the clouds of feather beds, Abraham's, Belisar's, apostles putting off to sea in butter boats, hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts, and yet that face of Marley, seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod and swallowed up the whole. If each smooth tile had been blank at first, with power to shape some picture on its surface from the disjointed fragments of his thoughts, there would have been a copy of old Marley's head on every one. Humber, said Scrooge, and walked across the room. After several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with the chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell began to swing. It swung so softly on the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bells ceased as they had begun together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard ghosts in the haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound and he heard the noise louder on the floors below and then coming up the stairs and then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His color changed, though, 
and without pause it came through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leapt up, although as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, and fell again. The same face, the very same, Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail and his coat skirts and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clapped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, for Scrooge observed it very closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked at the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before, he was still incredulous and fought against his senses. How now? said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? 